It is Tuesday, December 27th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. It is number two in our offerings of best of of 2022. Can't believe the year went that quickly. Today, uh, Lily Geismer, professor of history at Claremont McKenna College. We've had her on the program, I think, three or four times now. Discussing her recent book, Left Behind the Democrats' Failed Attempt to Solve Inequality. Important to see where uh, peeps have gone wrong. Um To get it right going forward. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree, Emma Uh, Vigeland? I would agree. And um, Lily Geismer is excellent. And this interview definitely deserved to be on Best Of. I will say that. I don't know who nominated it, but uh, we we put it through the committee uh, vote. And uh, we did the... The, the alkaline ed testing that we do on the all of these products. Thing. I mean, we paid a lot of money for that machine that does the raffle balls. It doesn't seem necessarily worth it. It but. doesn't. It doesn't. I'm not. Yeah, that was that was one of the that was I'm, I'm going to concede that that was probably uh, an unnecessary purchase. OK, um, but uh, we live and we learn. We'll tell you uh, that um, it's it's part of our giving 2022 uh series that we're doing which is basically just about uh, giving you best of so that we can give each other a vacation one per- one of the people who suggested this interview was a fan jeremy rosenberg so thank you jeremy thank oh, you jeremy wow look at you all right what's That's... his address do you can give us full details <laughs> yep, okay. so if you don't like it it's that guy's fault and go visit him so yeah maybe we maybe Maybe we don't I mean, need to Bradley's do last. Like, we don't need to do Bradley's last names. Doxing. Probably don't need to do last names. Probably, uh, Bradley. But yeah, okay. Uh, you want to post his plane coordinates too? There we go. It's it's assassination it. coordinates. Uh, assassination coordinates. If you dox, you get suspended. Uh-huh. Uh, so enjoy this, and then as a uh, as a special treat, after this, maybe some of you messed it over over the over the summer. Uh, there were some days that uh, my son was just not going into camp was just not into going to camp you know coming out of covid there's the you know kids have uh new sets of anxieties and this and that and and i'm like dude you're gonna have to come down to work with me he's like okay i'm like but i'm no ipad okay i'm like all right darn it and uh but it actually ended up being now he came into work like what, like four or five times, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, maybe more even. I don't know if you remember. Uh, Saul made an awesome um, tech deck ramp, like obstacle course. Uh, dude, out I of... got it in the other yeah, room, I... <laughs> and then I, I got down here. His uh, hold on for one second. I'll show you this. Yeah, uh, vamp for a second, Emma. I will. <laughs> that is not vamping, uh, incidentally. That is like, uh, like some type of jazz thing that you're yeah, doing. Yeah, I'm scared. But this is, uh, he made a um, uh, pencil holder for me. And uh, I keep that for a while, take a picture of it. And so we did, so yeah, we did some time trials on the, with the tech decks. But, um, and then, uh, and it would actually turned out to be great. It was, it was fun to just hang out with him. And he was, he was sort of into the show. Um, I'm not sure he understood what we were talking about half the time. But then he came on uh, in the interview and uh, was pretty inappropriate uh, mm-hmm. when I interviewed him. Shocking stuff. There was, uh, I'm not going to lie, there was some revelations that he, he dished on. Probably not something that I'm, 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 I'm proud about, but, yeah, you know. Who, who needs page six when you have Saul Seether yeah, this is spilling not a, the tea? Not exactly a blind item either. Uh, but uh, then we have this interview uh, that I did with Saul Seether. Uh, he, w- I don't think he was on camera, uh, but uh, we interviewed him, and um, you know, there you go. That's yeah. uh, that's a little birthday present to everybody. Not birthday, Christmas. Christmas, right? Yep. Jesus' birthday. Yeah. Jesus' birthday. <laughs> Amen. And also the New Year's, the new 2023's birthday coming up too. So enjoy those two things. We'll be back tomorrow with more. We've got some great uh, best ofs this week. So check it out. Don't forget, your support makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. And to also, uh, Sunset Lake still has that uh, Sabaday, sunsetlakesabaday.com. Uh, head over there, and uh, they're having a two-for-one on all of their smokables. Uh, 
So check that out. Of course, the uh, left is best code still works over there. All right. See you. Well, you'll see you in a minute, but then we'll see you again tomorrow. Okay. I uh, want to welcome back to the program. Lily Geismer, she is an associate professor of history at Claremont McKenna College, author of Left Behind, the Democrats' Failed Attempt to Solve Inequality. Uh, Lily Geismer, welcome back to the program. Uh, I think it's been uh, a couple of years. We've had you on for um, uh, your your first book, Don't Blame Us, um, about suburban liberals dealing with the uh, Massachusetts corridor around, I think it was 128. Um, and, uh, I, a, a, a couple of pieces that you wrote about that. And now you've written a book about really the ad- ascendancy of the DLC. Uh, well, I just want to start, like, why was that the next obvious uh, book for you to write? Well, thank you so much for having me back on and for such a good memory of my uh, my last appearances. Um, the um, the book Left Behind actually emerged in many ways from my uh, my first book, which was looking at suburban liberals in Massachusetts. Um, and the book ended with Mike Dukakis um, and his um, his um, time as governor of Massachusetts, and then his run for presidency in um, in, the, in 1998. 1988. I'm sorry. And I was really interested in this um, as I was looking at Mike Dukakis, his um, his embrace of tech as a solution to solving economic growth in Massachusetts, um, and how that then led to his uh, his being nominated for the presidency in 1988, and also his increasing use of the market and ideas of sort of using the market to do good. And I just wanted to think about how this was actually true of the Democratic Party more broadly. So how it became. In increasingly invested in using the private sector to do the work that was once largely the uh, it was advocated by Democrats that the government should do those kinds of programs, especially to help poor poor people and address problems of inequality. I you know I um, I, I grew up in Massachusetts. I remember the Massachusetts miracle that was basically bringing a lot of those uh, those tech companies to that 128 corridor. Um, and I remember when Bill Clinton was elected and, and looking around going like, uh, I mean, I remember exactly where I was and I remember, you know, everybody sort of celebrating. And I and I and I, I thought, like, oh, I can understand why there's a sigh of relief. But really, the, it, it, like I was not that excited. And I my understanding of the DLC and that whole turn that took place through that time was as a defensive measure. And, and, and I mix into this also uh, Tony Cohello, who uh, was a, a California uh, Democrat, who started raising a bunch of corporate money. And all these things sort of took place simultaneously. But you, um, your book sort of uh, uh, rejects that and makes the argument that this was actually sort of like a, I mean, a wrong, but affirmative, like ideological shift. Give us a sense before we get to that part of it how these people and a lot of this came out of like the southwest how these democrats perceived the democratic party um and and, and then talk about the, where the shift came from yeah so that's absolutely right so the thing that i tried to understand i think the classic story of the dlc and the democratic party more broadly since the 19 late 1960s is that everything that they did was in defensive reaction to the Republicans. And so the, the Republican Party is really the dominant story of kind of p- politics um, from the 70s onward. And so when p- people like Bill Clinton and his the cohort of New Democrats who are around the DLC were advocating for the market, it was all just kind of this, it, it's based on the idea of sort of how people think about it as triangulation, which was Dick Morris's famous <laughs> strategy um, in the 1986 election. And so that it was just kind of stealing from the Republicans. Um, and I wanted to look at how it wasn't, je- I mean, there's a component of reacting to Republicans, but but they actually really believed in the ideas of the market um, and to do good. And it is a bigger story than just Bill Clinton and goes back really to people like Tony Cohello and a, and a broader group of Democrats who, who come into office in 1974 with the, who uh, under the name at the time of the Watergate babies. And, um, and Dukakis is one of them, as are people like Tim Worth and Gary Hart, who all have the idea that they're they're called the Watergate babies because 
they came in in 1974 after Watergate, but really who they were opposing was the, the traditional Democratic Party. And they believed that the Democratic Party had become too beholden, first to, bureauc- to sort of ideas of bureaucracy and big government, and they, the party needed to be more efficient in its approaches to dealing with social problems. They were critical of the Great Society. But the other real problem they had is the Democrats had for, there are two things. One is that they had become too beholden to what they called special interest groups and especially the labor movement and needed to kind of re- readdress its strategies in terms of kind of political strategy to really focus on more middle class, moderate um, uh, suburbanites who are many of their, their, their constituencies and that's kind of the future. The other big thing was that the party, the party's um, economic policies were too beholden to Keynesian economic theory mm. and kind of too focused on, especially on, and with relation to labor, too, too focused on kind of manufacturing um, and needed to focus on on new what becomes new economy sectors like tech, trade, and finance. And so those things together will, would kind of be the future of the party. So that's really what they sort of begin to advocate in the 1970s. And it really comes to take hold in the 19, by the 1980s and then the 1990s under Bill Clinton. But the concept, sorry, the concept of efficiency, you mentioned that word, right? I mean, and as the party transitions to tech, finance, et cetera, that's a very financial or techie term as opposed to the Keynesian economics of the past. So, I mean, how did those interest groups and industries influence that kind of thinking within the party during that time? The um, well, it's, it's interesting because I think there's this idea of like that they, you know, sort of being having those kinds of relationships that where they're like they're being sort of influenced in various different ways. And I think a lot of that comes later um, there. There do become and I, my book tracks actually like um, especially the Democratic Party's relationship to Silicon Valley. But initially, I, the part of it has to do with the, there's a long standing faith within liberalism and the, and the Democratic Party in, in sort of technocratic approaches. Um, and so this goes back to the New Deal, which is very technocratic in its nature. And there's there's a piece of the market itself that's, that's quite kind of um, technocratic in its approach and, and is more efficient. And actually, there's a belief that it's more transparent, even though it's been in many ways, those kind of relationships become not very non-transparent. But I think especially after the the 1960s, where you have after Vietnam and then Watergate with this idea of government lying, there's a notion that sort of turning to the market will make it more both transparent, but also more efficient. Um, And using bringing in the kind of ideas of the private sector will make government um, a more effective measure, more effective. And that's really this been this ethos that the Democratic Party has really promoted um, really since the 1970s, or a wing of the Democratic Party. And I think it's become kind of the mainstream idea that you need to make government more efficient. That's that's sort of how it operates. I mean, the the DLC promoted the idea of like, we want to promote opportunity, not government, which is that kind of thinking. I, I don't know, for some reason, when you when you when you mentioned that it also reminded me of, of McNamara, too, right? I mean, he was brought in from Ford, I mean, to do this with the uh, with the Vietnam War very efficient uh, or theoretically anyways but but I, I just want to go backwards just a little bit too just to get a sense of like wh- where this en- emanated from because I know and, and then we can talk about also like you know the the what ultimately became their neoliberalism um, what is 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 slightly different from the neoliberalism that came out of like Mont Pelerin and and Milton Friedman and that whole crew but the how much of this was also a reaction to the the uh, sort of emancipatory politics of 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 the mid 60s because i know that you know the democratic party has a huge shift over the course of like those 20 years from the end of 1940s uh to uh you know the end of the 1960s where the democratic party had never won an election without a majority of white people. And then after 1960, uh, late 1960s, never wins a, an election with a majority of white people. How much of that played into this? Like when we hear special interests, you know, and, and I think like in your uh, first book, we, we see the beginning of the end of the relationship with uh, the unions and the Democratic Party. Um, but also we're talking about other special interests too, right? I mean, and, and when I hear that, I hear like black people, women, 
Uh, I mean, and, 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 and how much of that was a pushback against that type of politics? It's a combination. And so they, I mean, that's, there's a language of, so a lot of the language that emerges. And so there's the iterations, it's the Watergate babies who um, come into Congress, then they're often known actually as the first neoliberals or Atari Democrats. And they talk a lot about the ideas of shifting away from, um, from fairness to opportunity. And so fairness is a word that is l- deeply embedded in kind of ideas of social justice and, social, and the kind of social movements that you're talking about, particularly the civil rights movement. And that, it sounds like it's a minor move, but it's actually a major one that if you can kind of promote ideas of opportunities, everyone has a, a, has a chance to do that, which actually also is kind of market oriented in its thinking, because it's like the market can give everyone the chance to go ahead, to, to be, to be great. It's also meritocratic. Um, and that goes back to some stuff I talked about in my first book as well. So that's the kind of language that they're using. And the belief is that the party had been too focused on kind of um, on sort of redistribution. um, And that was sort of the ways in which they were helping redistribution. And then also kind of these ideas of fairness, which is to give every every group a say and to help groups in those ways. The Democrats of this kind of ilk are still in... um, in language focused on ideas of we want to help everyone and we believe in um, in equal equal rights um, for both for women for people of color, but their strategies um, do p- point in other ways. And I actually say that the ideology does just in many ways too. And that's kind of the what, some of the ways that sort of giving the market is giving everyone an opportunity to do that, um, as opposed to actually taking steps to ensure that that's possible. And those do have their roots in the 19, beginning in the 1970s, but really kind of come into being by the 1980s and 1990s. And was there something about what was something that was going on or in the nature of the Southwest or the fact that there was like sort of, I don't know, more expansion going on in the Southwest at that time that that led so many of these people who espoused, I guess, this ideology to come from the Southwest? There's a couple of things that um, that lead to it, um, and I can get. If I don't want to be too overly weedsy, but I'll, no, you know, please, I'll give the please answer. Do. So, um, so there are two there are two different things that are going on. Um, one is so especially so it's interesting with the story. I can use the story of Bill Clinton in particular, who's more from the South, um, but in a state like Arkansas, was losing a huge amount of its its. Um, it lost a huge amount of its industry. That it was a um, a very manufacturing sort of um, uh, state based on the idea of smokestack chasing, where in the 50s, they brought in all these companies who opened one company towns. But by the 70s, those ta- those companies had left and moved um, moved production overseas. So they desperately were in need of industry. And people like Bill Clinton see what was going on in Route 128 and Silicon Valley as the solution to the problems of places like Arkansas. So there's this focus on that as the kind of going to save our states. Um, that they also recognize what's going, the shift, the realignment that you described within the Democratic Party itself. And there's a whole wing of people who become part of the DLC um, who were Southern moderate Democratic governors like Chuck Robb of Virginia. Um, and they recognize that how the Democrats are going to are going to regain office is by focusing on white swing voters. Um, so the people you described who are leaving the Republican Party um, and that some of the ways by the, the time the DLC comes into by 1985, that was kind of what the language was perceived. So when the DLC starts, it's all white men, primarily from the South um, and Southwest. Um, and they that is the that's part of what they're the idea um of what they're trying to do that they're worried the party is going to take um a different direction i think it's actually this really interesting moment because there's like sort of this split um as to where the democratic party could have gone in the 1980s and this is the approach that they they see as kind of critical to both ideologically what the party should do but also in terms of its electoral strategy um i don't want to get ahead of ourselves but the the idea of wanting to replicate what happened at 128 route 128 in massachusetts in arkansas is a prime example of why almost the whole ideology doesn't work there's just not enough to go around like you like you can it just it's not scalable uh and 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 that's ends up being a problem with a lot of these ideas yeah and that's a huge part of like that all of the kind of i look at of this range of different market based ideas that they promote, especially around things like banking um, and things like microfinance. And a lot of them are sort of small scale solutions to much bigger problems. So there is the other issue. I mean, the major thing that's happening um, that is sort of underneath this, and I brief, I gesture to in a couple of places, is that the economy is going through a major recession in the 1970s. And there's this question of sort of, we need to come up with a solution to this problem, these problems. And so 
this is this the future lit lies in tech and trade and finance, and we can, we need to bring those across the country. And this becomes really part of the Democratic Party's what what they're going to offer for the future. So that goes back to the Mike Dukakis example. It is really what Bill Clinton sells in the 1990s, um, and I think it's really fascinating because to your to your point of like saying this isn't going to work, like these these ideas are still promoted. Like this is the whole you know turning coal miners into coders. Like it's not it's there's a there's this relentless idea in that in that in that faith and kind of that the tech industry can solve all of these problems um, when it, it, it's it been proven time and time again, it just can't. Well, I, I have a theory as to why it's so relentless is because those exact same people are still in power within the Democratic Party. And so, they, you know, and, and, you know, you usually you come in with one idea and it, it's going to take you for the rest of your career from, you know, that's the way most people operate. But but let me ask you this before. And I want to get into the details of like of Shore Bank and of of microfinance is just the because you focus on on those examples in particular uh but why did they win i mean it, it, and and i think like we're i think we're on the other side of that saga on some level it's it's still hanging on white knuckled within the democratic party but i think there's at least a lot of indications that that uh philosophy is has has died uh or is you know in in uh, you know convalescence uh but wh wh why did they win at that time so i think it's a couple of different things i think that this um there that are happening and that, that's a sort of critical question so and it as i said there was this these moments of kind of we look back to 1980s for the, where the democratic party was in this moment of kind of that it's often for political historians this moment of kind of failure um that the, there were two large losses at the um at the um at the presidential level. Um, and so the party, you know, 1984 and 1988 are both really interesting because you had someone like Jesse Jackson in the primary, and that could have been a direction for the party at that point to go after the, like the very special interest groups and to make that the kind of coalition of the party. Um, the DLC promotes the, this other approach of kind of, we focus on moderate, um, we focus on the kind of moderate swing voters um, and largely largely white and not non-voters. That's what this sort of idea that you go after people who are not voting in elections would be the kind of Jesse Jackson approach to this kind of non-voter approach. Um, that's part of what I think leads to, I mean, it leads to sort of these narrow wins. And I think it's really important. Bill Clinton did not win by a huge landslide in 1992. It was a narrow victory. Um, he, with a he didn't third even party get 50%. Yes. And so that's, I mean, so that's some of what happened. I mean, there was, there was a third party candidate who skimmed off a fair amount of, um, you know, it's a question of who, where, where that would have gone. I also think the issue is that, that one of the things is that Bill Clinton was a tremendously charismatic right. um, politician. So what I think what hap what, what I argue happens is that you have the DLC and then they, they had this theory that to win for the Democrats to recapture power was to win the president to win the presidency and you focus on the presidency to kind of gain dominance and they needed a but they needed a good candidate and bill clinton came was rising up through their ranks they select him to be their their chair um and so that becomes really effective so you have this i do think the ideology was 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 really powerful and bill clinton became a really really powerful mouthpiece for it and that leads to the kind of the winning in 1992 um, and then I think there's a number of things that happened in 1996, largely having to do with the um, economic growth um, of the 90s that, that leads Bill Clinton to win again. But I think one of the biggest issues for the Democratic Party has been this effort to kind of recapture that moment for so long. I just understand, like, to kind of try to recreate this, that, those dynamics. And I think one of the things has been to focus on these candidates to try to get, get that way, which has created real problems in the kind of larger infrastructure of the party. Then. So that's, that's goes to the kind of narrow win, but with really long-term consequences. P coupled with, with my argument would be in the book too, is that, that we often focus on elections, but actually it's like what happens in office when they enact policy that really matters. And so that there was all of these policies that are put into place that have really long-term um, and, and, in many ways, detrimental effects. Right. I guess I was asking less about why he won the national election than as opposed to that that sort of like um, interesting uh, fight within the Democratic Party. And 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 I mean, I'm trying to remember that um, that I mean, I I feel like it was his char charisma in and he talked like a populist too. Like he and Obama had a similar sort of like ability to come off as a populist, even though they weren't 
and turn it on during election years. I mean, oh, without he, a in doubt. 2012, oh. Obama spoke very differently than how he governed. Oh, yes. I mean, it was very much like a um, an affect a, 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 as much as it was, you know, Bill Clinton would go to McDonald's and they had to like tie him down so he wouldn't go to McDonald's was the uh, like in the in the run up. <laughs> to, I mean, I remember that. That was the big story about Bill Clinton. It was he would and, and, and the stories that they would always come out with, like he just spent his whole time talking to the guy at McDonald's. And um, and that was like they had him jogging to, to work off his McDonald's. And, and that was all the. Um, so it was so that in, in many respects, it was just sort of almost like a luck of a draw in terms of him winning that primary in 1992, I guess. Well, the, and the primary in 92 was a really complicated one with all these people. And he sort of did come out on top. I mean, he was a profoundly effective politician. And I think the other thing, and so with the DLC component, so they had this whole idea of we expand, um, you know, opportunity, not government through free markets was really their mantra. And Bill Clinton was able to sort of, as you said, it was, was able to promote that in a populist language that was really effective. And so this idea, and it was like the sort of we're coming in with kind of new, new, a new approach for new kinds of Democrats. And that that notion after 12 years of the Democratic Party not holding power was, I think, uh, was really was was effective and per pervasive um, in a number of different ways. I think the other thing I mean, which I argue in the book, going back to like this being affirmative, is Bill Clinton really did believe. So, like the DLC, and he, I think he helped. He really did help, as I show in the book, help to kind of. Um, solidify certain aspects of their policies as well. But he he really believed in the idea of the market to do good for poor people. So this idea that you could kind of use the market to do what the what what was traditionally um, the Democratic Party traditionally achieved through government, that you could sort of use the private sector to do those things. And that's something that he he believed he really had a belief in. So it wasn't just kind of pure political strategy. Uh, let's I, I want to get into uh, into Shore Bank, into the microfinance, but one just Tell us the concept of doing well by doing uh, good. Um, I mean that 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 that's a nice sort of like I don't know I don't a cake and eat it too type of thing or I can't tell what that is. It's sort of a rationale maybe. Well, it's that, and so the, my book looks a lot of that kind of language um, and using that actually as a way to think about the dominant ethos of the DLC and Clinton, which is this idea that you can kind of you can use. Um, that you can use the market to do what government could do, but also that the that market can sort of grow at the same time. And so instead of like the traditional democratic approach or liberal approach would be to keep those separate. So you wanna do well by doing economic growth and then having compensatory social welfare programs, you can fuse those together so that if you, that the, the private sector can, um, can do the work of government. And that's what I look at at the book is this becomes kind of critical to the democratic party under Bill Clinton's governing strategy. Another language that's just have your cake and eat it too is um, a lot of language of win-wins. Um, so this idea that like, and the idea of a win-win is that then it doesn't address the fact that like in a, in a capitalist system or in when you're using the market, you have wins and losses. Um, yeah. And so this idea, it's good for, it's good for everybody. Um, and that's really what becomes their, um, the logic of, of the New Democrats DLC um, approach to governance. That's also just Silicon Valley, is it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I feel like that phrase has been repeated uh, in, in, you know, it's it's very much uh, how, not to bring up Theranos, but they justify um, their kind of business practices and they attract a lot of neoliberal investors using that ideology, honestly. Totally. And so that's, I think the thing about that I found, I mean, that that's why you have this kind of coalescence of the Democrats with Silicon Valley is that the ethos is actually quite similar. Um, and so that they, and it's, a, it's attractive. So it's not just about kind of the money, like let's pay, like, well, we're going to like give you lots of donations. It's actually, they, they believed in these ideas as well. Um, and so in the book, I look extensively at their relationship with charter schools, um, which is a very much like doing well by doing good kind of idea too. And that's kind of it becomes kind of critical to the language of how I think Silicon, Silicon Valley and the, this, this, the Clinton version of the Democratic Party, um, the ideas that they promote. That's certainly the quote that I'm going to use when I go uh, work for Jeff Bezos in his uh, <laughs> new initiative that we haven't worked out yet, the details. <laughs> but um, well, I talk about Shore Bank and how that sort of plays into that, that whole thing. 
Yeah, so I the I look the one of the things the book tracks is this um, community development bank called Shore Bank, which is based in Chicago. Um, or it it was started in the nineteen seventies, and it was the idea that you could use a you could use a a commercial bank to do economic redevelopment in um, in a low income community. And Shore, they were based in um, South Shore, which is a neighborhood in Chicago. It's actually where, where Michelle Obama grew up. And Bill Clinton becomes really taken with this idea that Shore Bank is successful in in Chicago and invites the founders to start a bank in, in actually in the 1980s in, um, in Arkansas um, based on this model. And Shore Bank at the time had also been working with Muhammad Yunus, who was the founder of um, Grameen Bank, which is kind of the, seen as the kind of real, really the, the founders of microfinance and the ideas of microenterprise in, um, in Bangladesh, which is the idea of giving small loans to poor women to help them start their own businesses. And um, the the people from Shore Bank tell the Clintons about about Eunice. They become really, really taken with that idea. So they bring him to Arkansas as well to start a micro micro enterprise organization in the Arkansas Delta in the 1980s. And then when Bill Clinton's running for president in 1992, he wait, wait, really does. Does that have success? I mean, it's almost sounds laughable. Like we're going to we're going to get each one of these these, uh, you know, poor women. They're going to start their own businesses like Who's going to buy this stuff? Like everybody's got their own business and everybody's like, I don't know, selling like. And the, the, the cream will rise to the top. The best of the best will come out of it. I mean, so it's just capitalism. But that's, but that's not, but, but that's not the theory. Isn't that like some's going to just like, we're going to get some people to explain. It's like, it's going to sustain everybody. I don't understand. They don't don't care. I mean, they probably don't really think about sustaining everybody. They're fine with a certain level of, I mean, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm talking over you, but. No, 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 no. I mean, it's it's an interesting idea because it's like why this and this was a really, I mean, microfinance, microenterprise in the by the early two thousands was like a was this idea that sort of caught on like wildfire, um, and especially in the in internationally. Um, and there's questions of if it actually works internationally as well. Um, and so, but I mean, it, it, Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Prize, um, and it, it sort of there's a the, so there's questions if it's working there. But I think the idea that this could work in the U S. is one of the things that I look at. Um, and what they want to do is actually to use it for two things. One is to do economic redevelopment and these communities have lost all their businesses, but also to replace welfare. So it's the idea like you don't need wealth, like you don't need to get welfare payments. You can turn your hobby into a business. So like you love to sell coffee cake, like you can do that and promote it. And then you can start like what the theory behind it is, is like you can then you'll be really good at selling your coffee cakes. So then you'll start your own coffee cake company and then you'll employ other people in the town um, and they can all work for you. And then you'll have this, that's the kind of self-sustaining growth. So that's like the idea behind it. Um, and this was, I mean, the, the, the Clintons promoted this like crazy in the nineties. Um, and then Hillary Clinton really made it part of her kind of mission as first lady and then as Senator, and then as first lady, actually, I mean, as a secretary of state later um, in internationally, um, and it's been proven widely not to work in the U.S. Um, for many of the reasons that you can assume. I mean, um, and so I think it's this very idealistic idea. And so some of the idea of cream to rise with the crop, crop, it's this idea that everyone at their core wants to be an entrepreneur. So I think that it's like this entrepreneurial based idea. What I argue in the book and other places is that this is um, one of the things it does. And this is actually also where it connects to Silicon Valley because people like um, the founder of eBay love this. Like they they are like really taken with this idea. But it actually sort of like obscures it by calling everyone an entrepreneur, it obscures fundamental class differences. So like Jeff Bezos and the woman selling coffee cake are not the same, um, but it's sort of putting them in the same categories. So you don't you don't address the fact that these people don't have they don't have stability like that's what you lose when you're an entrepreneur um and if you're taking away welfare at the same time it has a it has really really negative impacts it it seems insane to me on multiple levels the idea that this is a i mean because i think you make the point in the book that like there's nothing wrong with a micro finance uh but it but to have it be the center point of a way of addressing these things is it that have it be the center. I mean, I, I think it would and be at great the add-on. of social but, programs. Well, yeah, that's right. the point. Yeah, is yeah. that like it, 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 you know, as an add-on after the fact, after you've, it, but the idea that you're going to have enough micro financed businesses that grow to replace um, social services, and then the idea that like 
I'm a, uh, a woman with one child who makes $18,000 a year. I don't have any uh, intergenerational wealth. I don't have family or friends who are wealthy either. But I'm similarly situated as someone who does have all those things to make a chance to make I'm making my big life's bet on this coffee cake. It's insane. It's insane to think that this is scalable. I, I just don't I can't wrap my head around how anybody thought that it was. I, I, I mean, I, on some level, I feel like and this, I think, is too much too much of a psychological assessment. But both Barack Obama and Bill Clinton came from very messed up uh, uh, situations where their meteoric rise within the context of our country, I think, blinded them to the reality of like, they just won the lottery. And uh, essentially, they won life's lottery and they just assume everybody else can too. Well, I think there's a lot, there's so, I, 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 there's so much to that. I think that's, and also the, all the uh, many other um, Democrats who believe in this idea are people who who all had success in various different ways and sort of have a faith that that's the way you go you go forward. And I think absolutely. So the, the point I make in the book is like I don't think microfinance or microenterprise is a bad idea in and of itself. Like if you have it on top of having a robust social welfare state, but the idea that this could replace it is just is 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 faulty. And I think the problem is it then actually leads to um, this is where we have increased inequality after the 1990s. So it actually sort of harms the, the, the and it leads to sort of further less, further shrinking the social safety net to the point you have nothing. And for Bill Clinton in particular, like he, and this is what goes to also his larger promotion of welfare to work, is that he often would talk about this idea of kind of, it's not just the kind of that you'd get, you'd have the money, but it's also the sort of psychological power of having a job. And so he really believed in this notion that and that was good for your kids too, to see you have a job. And that goes to like this, his own sort of psycho, the psychoanalysis of his own ex childhood experience that like for poor people, they need to have a particular kind of notion of, of um, a role model of success and having mothers who work will do that. Well, how, mu how much did the Moynihan report play into their thinking? Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, there's, there have particular ideas of sort of that, um, that women, you need to have sort of particular ideas of, sort of strong families. I mean, I think the other thing that goes to the Mo sort of the Moynihan Report, but more the story of sort of the welfare queens from it. Um, and this is another thing I argue in the book is that um, in some ways, this is different than the welfare queen argument, because it's sort of saying it's instead of saying like every poor person is like the potential entrepreneur, entrepreneur, but it actually then blames people who are not, who who don't follow the, who don't do that. And so in the book, I use a lot, of, I mean, this is, Clinton uses classic language of like play hard and um, work hard and follow the rules, but that inherently stigmatizes people who are not, like who are purportedly not following the rules. And then those people get in, incredibly punitive punishment for it, be that losing welfare um, benefits, but then also um, this is coupled with all of the crime legislation um, of the 1990s. So those two things actually come come to work hand in hand. So you have this idea of like it's like re it's repositioning who is like a good a good poor person and a bad poor person. So like the successful micro enterprise is like an entrepreneur is like a good poor person who's working hard, um, whereas like anyone else falls into this other category. Um, and is like is deeply deeply um, stigmatized and actually like often in, in prison for it. And I feel that like that, really, sorry, I feel like got really, really no, dark no, there. No, but. but I but I feel like that narrative also works the other way in sort of like a Paul Ryan esque type of thing because if you if we set it up so that if you play by the rules, you get a fair shake, you know, there the land of opportunity, it also then uh, comes back around and says like and so if you're not doing well that's because you're not playing by the rules. And, and you know, it, 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 we start to get into sort of like Paul Ryan territory here, it, it feels like, in terms of that ideology. How is this neoliberalism, this, this notion of, you know, private partner, private public partnerships and the idea of like, we're just going to give, you know, we're going to help people in business and that's going to supplant the the role of government and then, you know, and, and I should say, we saw this all through the Obama administration in, in like Cass Sunstein and, 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 and all sorts of other figures who had this similar ideology. Um, how, how is that different from the neoliberalism of the, the Mott Pelerin strain that goes through um, uh, Milton Friedman? Yeah, and this is something I really I wanted I look at in my book too, which I was really interested in is this idea. So oftentimes Clinton is lumped together with um, with this kind of 
with these other forms of neoliberalism under Reagan and Friedman and the Mount Power and Society. Um, and I see the difference as they still believe in a, in a place for government. And so it's the idea of government as catalyst. So government is sort of what creates the spark between the public and private sectors in a way that um, they still, there's still a place there that, that, uh, that, and it, that government has particular responsibilities um, to make those possible. The Mount Pelerin Society, Milton Friedman, this is a kind of grossly oversimplified version of it, but they really believe in sort of getting government out. So ideally someone like Paul Ryan or Jack, Jack Kemp, who was kind of his predecessor of sort of that compassionate conservative, um, kind of ilk of, of, of Republican, um, their ultimate idea is that everything goes to the private sector. So like everything ultimately becomes privatized in a way that the this version does not believe in. They still believe in this in this idea of um, of government playing some particular role, but it's a, li a more limited role than you would see in a, in a under a more kind of socially democratic democratic party. Um, and I think in my, what I argue in the book is that actually like, I, I really believe that intent matters. So you could say that the outcome is exactly the same. You still have poor people in a, um, in a position where the social safety net has been is eviscerated. Um, there's vast inequalities in all kinds of ways, but it's actually really important to understand what they were trying to do. Um, and a lot of these programs, be it looking to the tech and promoting the tech industry or and various different forms of deregulation, the idea was this was actually going to help people. Where are we? Is that is that epoch? Are we done with that era? I mean, I, are are we too close to really be able to say it's definitively over? But is it? And I know this isn't you know as a historian, I'm asking you to project <laughs> into the future. But in in 15 years from now, are uh, are uh, historians going to start to say like, okay, it ended in you know I don't know the second decade of the 20th century. This started to end. 20, well, I, I, second, yeah, I think about this and I would be curious of both of your thoughts too on it. Um, in my mind, it's culturally over to some degree. I mean, you don't have this, the Democratic Party did not in the 2020 election promote things like charter schools and all of the kind of market programs like micro enterprise that were so sort of quintessential. And, and I, I do think Obama did do a lot of that um, in the um, in the mid, you know, 2000, around 2010 to 2012. Um and this kind of culturally tech doesn't hold the same place that it once did, but I still think they actually, they're still, um, they're still holding pop. They have, they've, uh, it's affected policy in various different ways. Um, and it's had long-term effects um, on the ability to, to create certain kinds of policies. So while I see sort of someone like Biden is not using that, that kind of language, I still think the, I think the impact has still been there. And I do think there's the potential for those things to come back, given sort of who has, who holds power. And that's what's kind of dangerous. I think also the other place that's quite, quite, um, if you think about it, just in terms of the Democratic Party, the other kind of component of this is that there's off the Democrats have go time and time again back to this political strategy. So whereas the DLC is, is shut, shut its doors and they don't, you know, Bill Clinton's not the marquee speaker anymore at um, conventions. There's still at every at every election, there's the idea that like if we need to win, we should not be trying to kind of shore up marginalized people. Um, but instead, the solution to the Democrats winning office is to go after moderate suburbanites. Um, and that's what happened in 2018. And I very much see that that's the way that the party seems to be turning right now. Um, well, they with seem years to of be, listening. yeah, I mean, it's the whole conversation about means testing the student loan debt. They're ter that they are trying to appeal to that constituency that you, that you, I mean, uh, that you talk about there and that, that this is just, this is Biden's political ideology. And I think, as you say, culturally we've moved on and COVID I think was the death nail for it in terms of, you know, anybody a little bit younger and uh who's voting democratic but biden is still very much committed to that and or he, he knows no other way really yeah and i think i mean i think he um he there's some level of like we need to do more because there, i mean i think there are two things going on i think absolutely like one piece is that unlike the 90s you do actually have a left wing a powerful left wing pushing back in a way that there was just that that voice was somewhat was absent for a number of reasons in the 90s but I think what's important is that Biden was a founding member of the DLC, and I think he's less ideological in many ways than Bill Clinton was. But a lot of the people who are um, his senior advisors are were, it, it are people like 
Bruce Reed, Gene Sperling, who are all who are all heavily invested in this approach. And so there's a question of like that that maintaining um, that affecting policy in various different ways. And and always I think taking those approaches of like we need to both in terms of like that's the right approach, but also this is the way to win a, win for us to win and win and maintain power. I just want to touch on that on that that that, that, that dichotomy you just you just talked about. You have an ideological element that uh, you know. The, the 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 Bruce Reeds, um, and then you have this sort of like political, strategic one. What what's the sequencing there? Like I mean, like I mean, obviously, like if I'm, if I have this ideology, I'm going to seek out consultants who are going to say like, actually, the, strategically, this meshes, right? Like, do we ever see a break? In other words, could like could we make an assessment right now that the the White House is full of because I think, you know, I think Joe Biden is, you know, marginally relevant to, uh, relative to, honestly, to the, the people that he's surrounded himself with or who have, you know, uh, accrued. And so, like, Bruce Reed and one or two other advisors may be just as important, you know, on some level, depending on who's countering them in the White House. I, I think there's an argument right now about student debt that, that probably plays this out. And you have both the policy people and the ideologues and the political people who are talking about how this is going to impact the, the politics. Do like how much of that, that, that distinction is there through this story. And is there a sense that one of those cohorts can exist without the other? I mean, because I think we're sort of probably still have, more of those people who believe this stuff politically and don't ideologically are not as married to it or may not be, but it's irrelevant because they're, they're mercenaries on some level and they're, they're, they've found a way that they make their money uh, with this political advice as opposed to these, these ideologues, um, which I think at this point has to be largely, you know, like just completely bankrupt. I mean, whether it's like the Gates Foundation Rand Corporation saying like, you know, your whole school choice, your whole school program was a disaster. You don't have the Arne Duncans anymore. You have them out. You don't have the Cass Sunsteins in this administration. It seems like the political people for the large part are still there, but not necessarily the ideologues. Yeah, I think that that's right. And so that so it's an interesting point because of that with that with that dimension with that dimension. And I do think some people like Bruce Reed and Gene Sperling have shown some capacity for change, but they're not, they're not hardcore going after the kinds of programs that they did in the 1990s. And so a recognition that that's not sort of suited for the moment, but it is an issue of like, for genuinely trying to combat inequality, that canceling student debt would be a really critical way to get there. So if, if you actually believe in policies that want to want to achieve those results, um, that, that, is how you go about it. And there's been real, we've seen real limitations of doing that. And so I do think that there is this place of, of particular kinds of political strategists making making decisions. And I think there's, a. I mean, I think the other thing that's different about the 90s, and I will go, go back to my point of like, as I said, I'm like, I started out saying like the Republicans don't matter, <laughs> but like, I do think they do matter. I mean, I think that what's happened, the Republican party has changed so dramatically um, in many ways since the 1990s, that that is a force to contend with too. And I think they're very afraid of that um, and very afraid of kind of what the Republicans look like, even though in many ways that like, you would think in some ways opening up the fact that there's no potential for part bipartisan cooperation could actually lead to com some programs and something like student debt, they don't need to go through Congress for. So it's like, it's, 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 it is a thing of like, this is not, this is not appealing to our perceived white suburbanite who we need to win, we need to, who we need to maintain Congress. And so therefore we're not going to, we're not going to do it. Lily Geisberg, associate professor of history at Claremont McKenna college. The book is left behind the Democrats failed attempt to solve inequality. We will put a link to that at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, folks. Same. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow, what? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. 
Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun hack. Matt. Who? Fun hack. What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No me key. You did it. Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's- Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight? Yes. on your mind sports we can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism oh, i'm gonna go start who libertarian they're so stupid though common sense says of course gobbledygook we fucking nailed him so what's 79 plus 21 challenge man i'm positively quivering i believe 96 i want to say 857 210 35 501 one half three eights 911 for instance Thirty-four hundred dollars, nineteen hundred dollars, five, four, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. Of but, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> The week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, um, Got to jump. Got to be quick. I got to jump. I'm losing it, bro. Um, Two o'clock, we're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Um, We have a guest in studio uh, today. Uh, for the fun half, this is a function of school ending uh, just yesterday. Uh, public school, uh, I'd like to welcome to the program, Saul Cedar. Uh, Saul, this is your is this your first time on the program? I think I've been one time, but I didn't talk. Okay, well, uh, now you're here, you're talking. Uh, tell us, um, school ended yesterday. Do you want to give us a, a sense of how school went this year? Good. Okay. And um, how did, uh, w- was it was it difficult with uh, COVID or was it a more or less normal year? It was kind of normal. Kind of normal. Okay. Any specific things about third grade that you thought were um, unique or interesting or particularly good or particularly bad? Uh, not really. Okay. Great. Uh, good stuff. You want to talk more about politics? Uh, no. No? Well, you know, this is a uh, politics show. Yeah, I do, but I don't know anything about about it, so. You don't? No, not Are really. you sure? Well, a tiny bit, but not really. Um, what do you think about Mitch McConnell? I have no idea who that is. What do you think about the Republicans <laughs> in general? Uh, stuff. Okay, <laughs> great, great. Well, you're making me look uh, like I really taught you well. It's good. Are you, uh... Anything, uh, what are you reading these days? Wings of Fire. Wings of Fire? Yeah. What's that about? Dragons. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else you want to add? Is there anything that you want to touch on today? No. No? <laughs> All right. Have you enjoyed uh, being, um, have you enjoyed being in studio? Yes. Yeah? What's your favorite part about the studio? Uh... Um, it has a bathroom. Right, that's true. It is extremely convenient. It would have been a real drag if it didn't have a bathroom. 
Our last one didn't. I don't think you ever saw that one. It though. did it. Oh, hey, will you talk about Disney for a little bit? What was your Disney experience like when we went to Disney World? Uh, really fun, actually. It was? Yeah. Every day? Uh, Disneyland wasn't the fun. Disneyland wasn't the funnest? Well, no, what was no, the no, funnest? The, the Disney area right. where we saw the castle thing. Uh, probably Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood Studios was the funnest. Oh, yeah? Okay. And how do you think I did as a father just in terms of keeping my uh, stuff together during that? Not so good. Not so good. Not so good. <laughs> how many, how many, many stories? How many emotional breakdowns would you say I had during the trip? <laughs> oh, uh, let me count. I don't know, like 20? 20? No, m maybe a tiny bit less, like 15, but... Okay, so that was about uh, more or less two a day. Yeah. Okay. All right. How long did they last? Eh, 30 seconds each. 30 seconds each? Yeah, yeah you, it's not too bad. Yeah, you're not that good at uh, stuff. <laughs> I'm not that good at stuff? Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. That's, that's nice to say. Um, anything else about Disney you want to talk about? Uh, well, you did get me a seven-foot lightsaber. That's true. Plastic. Well, yeah. Like, well, it was it's like, it's like away. two lightsabers. Yeah. You put them together in like the Sith lightsaber, I think. No. Oh my God, I forgot the name of the guy who had it. And oh my God, but it was like two put together, but you could take them apart and it would be two lightsabers. They're like three and a half feet each. Yep. They're pretty big. And they, but they also collapsed down. Yes. So we were able to take them in the suitcase. That was yes. the big thing. Um, uh, anything you want to talk about movies? You want to talk about the last movie we watched together? Because it's pretty exciting for oh me. God. I forgot what it was called, but it was a spaghetti western. It was a spaghetti western. That's correct. It was the first of one. Which one was it? I don't remember the first name, but it was... Uh, Fistful? Fistful of... Dollars? Yes. Yes. And that was pretty good, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, there was this... The ride, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Yeah, you got to talk into the microphone. <laughs> the Pirates of the Caribbean ride was really fun. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, we did have a good time with that. All right. Um, can we get some uh, baseball updates, Saul? How, oh. the, how the baseball season went? Oh, yeah, that was that was good. Um, oh, your baseball season, yeah. Well, and Sam's as a coach as well. Uh, I got two double plays in one game. Yep, That's you crazy. did. What yep, the reflexes. One was completely self um uh, uh self assisted. The unassisted, the unassisted the un double play. or the unassisted. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that game I got six outs. Yeah. Yeah. And uh well. and also uh what did you do with your hit? What are you hitting? Oh yeah, I got uh good hitting, I think. Okay. Good. <laughs> oh, the yeah. slugger. Oh yeah, um it was Darth Maul. Oh yes. I don't know if that's right, but yeah, people um, are a little upset that you didn't know. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, I got coached by, uh, we went to this base batting cages, and we got, uh, well, I got coached by the coach who coached Manny Ramirez in high school. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, guy named Tito gave uh, Saul some pointers and told us some a couple of stories about Manny Ramirez. Uh, that was pretty good. All right. Uh, lastly, what is your favorite Jim Carrey movie? People want to know. Oh, uh, probably The Mask. Great the Mask. Choice. Yes. Do you want to do any Jim Carrey in impressions? No. Well, or dumb, or Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. All righty then. <laughs> what did you think about what? Uh, uh you do, do. You need to do a better voice. I, I, I'm yeah. sure, I know. <laughs> I know. Give me, give me a few more times. Do you want to say who so. you like better, Bradley or Matt? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I folded that paper seven times, so. That's true. He did. All right. Well, well Matt didn't try, so. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, this, is, uh, this has been great. Is there anything else you want to uh, say before I uh, kick you off the set? Wait, what? <laughs> well, I got to do, do the rest of the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I do have a riddle. Um, okay. Uh, uh, what walks on... Four legs, two legs, and three legs in one lifetime. Four legs, two legs, and three legs in one lifetime. Yeah. I would say a person. Start as a baby, then yes. you walk, and then you need a cane. Yes, correct. It's not only legs, but yeah. Oh, all right. I got it. I can't believe that. All right, well, there you go.
Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to leave these headphones, like, right here. Yep. Like, oh. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Saul, for joining us. That was a real uh, treat for, I think, for, you know, a couple of people. Dad. Yeah. Could I sit here the whole time? Yeah, you can. Yes. But you got to go get your book. I mean, you can listen to the show. You can do whichever one you want. Yeah, I'll do I'll grab my book. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, you're welcome for that part of the uh, program. Um, it was a little treat. Um, we will, uh, maybe we'll do that again someday. Yep, maybe. I thought you were pretty good. You did a pretty good job. You'll be taking this show over. You're taking over the old man's business. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I guess somewhere the choice is made for the option where you don't get paid, for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive Between the 101 and the 5 Do you know how far the detail takes you? Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright Shifted in and out.